And today I'm going to talk about how to breathe properly. So my interest in this learning how to breathe thing uh, started by this book that I recently got off of Amazon, which appropriately is also titled Breath. And it's by an author named James Nestor, who claims that breathing has kind of become a lost art that humans ever since the Industrial Revolution have lost the ability to breathe properly. So when I first uh, heard Nestor's claim, I was a bit skeptical because I thought breathing is something that humans do so often, you know, thousands of times a day. If we were doing it wrong in some fundamental way, surely there should be signs. People should be having illnesses or some other type of problems. Nestor actually starts off you know, assuming that perhaps my reader doesn't think that this is a big deal. So he starts off his book by talking about a patient who actually has a lot of the problems that come from what he described as breathing incorrectly. So he paints this vivid portrait of a patient who has blocked airways, who has a disfigured mouth that's not big enough to fit 32 teeth which of course is the normal number of teeth that a human should be able to fit. It's not able to breathe properly. And it turns out that this patient with the disfigured mouth and nose is Nestor himself. After seeing that, I thought, okay, wow, whatever he's talking about, he clearly has experience, so he's not joking. And that got me intrigued. So I really began paying attention to his message after that. And this is what I learned from Nestor's experience about how to breathe the right way. The first lesson in breathing correctly is to shut your mouth. And what I mean by that is that we need to breathe from the nose. So in his book, he actually brings up a statistic that says around half of all people claim to be serial mouth breathers. They typically inhale air through their mouth and exhale through their mouth as well. There's actually a very important reason why you want to use the nose rather than the mouth. And that's because the nose has evolved over thousands of years, thousands and millions of years for the express purpose of inhaling air. I think for many people, there's this perception that it doesn't really matter where the air comes in, whether it's the nose or the mouth, as long as it gets to the lungs, where you can extract the oxygen from it. But actually it turns out that the nose, because it's evolved specifically to inhale air, it comes with a whole bunch of extra benefits that you just lose if you start breathing from the mouth. Breathing from the nose pressurizes the air, which is beneficial to your airways. It filters the air for particles that you don't want entering your body. One particularly interesting thing that I learned is that when we breathe through the nose, our sinuses produce a chemical called nitric oxide, which among many other uh, functions also is related to the sexual response in humans. And you might know nitric oxide by its commercial trade name, Viagra. Breathing from your mouth, on the other hand, does not carry any of these extra benefits. The mouth is designed to chew food and take in food and it can provide air if necessary uh, for short bursts, but it doesn't have any of the extra benefits that breathing from the nose has. In fact, you know, Nestor explains that breathing from the mouth can create this destructive cycle of breathing even more from the mouth. And so you lose these nasal benefits. The reason why that might happen is because when you inhale from the mouth, one of the things that the mouth doesn't do is it doesn't pressurize the air like the nose does. And so when the air gets into the airways, there's a pressure mismatch and the muscles actually start drooping and so the airways start constricting. And when that happens, you need to inhale more air to compensate and that makes you breathe even more from the mouth because you think, oh, I can suck in even more air from the mouth. And so mouth breathing kind of creates this uh, vicious cycle of even more mouth breathing, which leads to even more damage. Nasal breathing, on the other hand, you know, you have all these benefits and they accrue on top of each other and they encourage more nasal breathing. So that creates a virtuous cycle as opposed to the vicious cycle of mouth breathing. The next thing that we need to do is we need to use our lungs to their fullest capacity. Typically, we don't use our lungs anywhere near their maximum capacity. This is important because study after study has shown that lung capacity is actually a very strong indicator of life expectancy right alongside diet as well as exercise. 
So the question now becomes, how do we increase our lung capacity? One of the most important ones that we just completely neglect is engaging our diaphragm when we breathe. The diaphragm is a muscle that lives underneath our lungs and it's vitally important in breathing. When we inhale, our diaphragm relaxes. And what this does is that it expands the space available in our chest. And so it reduces the pressure and allows air to come into our chest. So then we inhale. And then when we wanna exhale, the diaphragm contracts and lifts up. That reduces the amount of space in the chest. It increases the pressure. And so the air then comes out and we can exhale. This up and down motion happens about 50,000 times a day, but we barely engage our diaphragm to its fullest extent. We only make it move about 10% of what it possibly can. One of the things we can do is to simply just exhale fully. Normally when we, you know, we breathe, we'll take, maybe we'll take a deep breath in, but then we'll just let it out, even if it's a deep breath. Right, the air will just come out and the diaphragm will barely need to rise up. But when you exhale deeply, what you do is you exhale in a deliberate manner. So I exhale and now I can feel the tension in my chest. I can feel the diaphragm working. Typically we might exhale for on the order of one to two seconds. A fuller exhale might be more like five or six seconds. And that makes our diaphragm move up much more than it normally does and engages it further. This you know, is important because this strengthens our diaphragm and this allows us to use our lungs to their fullest capacity. So one of the people who realized the power of exhaling fully and getting your diaphragm involved to be able to use your lungs to their fullest capacity was Carl Stau. Stau was a uh, somewhat eccentric choir conductor born in the 1920s and he developed these breathing techniques because he wanted to uh, help musicians stop becoming short of breath so that they can play they could play their instruments more easily the techniques he developed did exactly that musicians reported being able to hold their breaths for longer and play their instruments more easily seeing his success there the u.s olympic team actually called him in for the 1968 olympics in mexico city where he did a lot of breath work with many of the athletes and the runners for the 68 Olympics. And after working with Carl Stau, the US runners had a fabulously successful Olympics with many runners breaking their personal records or world records. Step number three is to breathe slower. Think back to the last time you, know, you were on a run or exercising pretty hard. At the end of it, you were probably panting, you were probably going like, Let's excuse for a second the fact that you're breathing from your mouth. You now know not to do that, but you'll also notice that you're breathing pretty fast. It's fairly easy to try and come up with an explanation for that. You'd think, okay, well, when I'm exercising, my cells are working harder, so they need oxygen more quickly, and I need to get rid of the carbon dioxide that I produce quickly as well. And so when I breathe faster, I'll replace that oxygen very quickly, and I'll also get rid of the carbon dioxide very quickly. It turns out that's actually also not true. You need a certain concentration of carbon dioxide in your body to be able to absorb oxygen efficiently. If we breathe, you know, sort of at the normal rate of breathing, you might only absorb up to a quarter of the oxygen available. Whereas if you breathe a little bit slower and you let a little bit of carbon dioxide build up in the blood, that can help extract more of the oxygen from the air that you breathe in. If you just breathe too fast, chances are you'll take in more oxygen, but you'll just breathe a lot of it back out. And so it doesn't really help you overall. But how do I breathe slower? How do I know how slow to breathe? One remarkable guide that people have found um, for the right breathing pattern comes from prayer. Scientists studied the breathing patterns from a lot of the prayer chants from religions all over the world, including Hinduism, Taoism, Native American religions, Christianity as well, and they discovered something remarkable. All of these religions, you know, the words of the chants were different, but the breathing patterns that they led to were remarkably similar. You'd have words separated by a set number of seconds, and of course, you know, you inhale during the pauses and then you exhale while you speak. So that creates your breathing rhythm. 
and scientists found that there was a remarkably similar pattern to these from chants all across the world. By analyzing all these chants, the scientists determined that the optimal breathing rate, what Nestor calls the perfect breath, was five and a half seconds of an inhale and then five and a half seconds of an exhale. That sounds fairly straightforward, but let me demonstrate it to you now just to show how different this is from how we breathe normally. That's my inhale, now I'll exhale. That's the perfect breath. Now we have the next step of this breathing puzzle, which is you need to breathe slower. Breathe the perfect breath. Another key step is to actually breathe less. So take less air in per breath. A human lung can on average store about four to six liters of air but our normal breathing patterns actually make us take in far more air than that. And a lot of it just goes to waste. The Indian yogis and Tibetan monks have known this for centuries. And one of the things they actually practice is to breathe less essentially while they're at rest. One of the first Western uh, observers of this was a Soviet uh, doctor named Konstantin Butieko. So Konstantin Butieko analyzed his patients and he observed that the sickest ones consistently tended to breathe too much. They would take in 15 liters of air per minute. They would also tend to be consistent mouth breathers. Meanwhile, the healthiest patients tended to breathe far less, closer to five to six liters, and they tended to breathe from the nose. So now we, we are more certain that the optimal amount of air that you wanna take in per breath is closer to that five to six liter range. And Nestor actually tells us that you should aim for five and a half liters of air intake per minute. A good rule of thumb is to try roughly take five and a half breaths per minute. By doing that, you'll naturally tend to take five and a half liters of air in per minute. And if you go through the math, you realize that that corresponds to inhaling and exhaling for five and a half seconds, which is exactly what we discussed when we were discussing what makes up the right rate of breathing. So one of the best things you can do to improve your breathing is simply to practice breathing this perfect breath. Five and a half seconds inhale, five and a half seconds exhale, and you'll get the optimal air intake for free. And finally, one other thing that has an indirect impact on our breathing is the structure of our bones, and in particular, the structure of our bones in our face. Ever since the Industrial Revolution, the foods we've been eating have gotten more processed and so they require less chewing, they're softer. As a result, our bones adjust to that new reality. Our jaws become smaller, our mouths also become smaller, and this leads to the structure of the airways changing and becoming smaller and making it harder to breathe. A very easy way to reverse that is to simply just chew more. You can do that by eating more natural hard foods such as nuts or maybe some type of fruits or many people have recommended chewing gum regardless if it makes your mouth move more and chew more it'll help your facial bones expand again and open up your airways to help breathe more naturally so in summary if we want to get our breathing back to where it's supposed to be there's a simple list by list recipe to follow number one you need to breathe through your nose Number two, you need to exhale properly and get your diaphragm fully involved. Number three and four, they're kind of two sides of the same coin. You need to breathe slower and you need to breathe less. And finally, you want to chew more with your mouth and your teeth so you can undo those changes that lead to the constriction of airways so you can breathe easier. So that does it for this video. I hope these tips help you achieve the perfect breath and I'll see you later.